Hi, I'm Jean Schumacher. I am founder of Simply Plant Based, and I've got several programs to help change your health destiny. The first one, Weight Loss Advantage, helping you to lose weight without dieting. And I also, if you're already plant based, I've got a continuing education program to help support you and guide you through this process. And coming soon with Dr. Deborah Shapiro, the Pregnancy Advantage. And tonight, I have the opportunity to connect with Dr. Frank Sabatino, who is the director of Balance for Life. And if you've not been to or heard about Balance for Life, oh my God, it's amazing. Deerfield Beach, Florida, right on the beach where you can go down and take a smart vacation. So thank you, Dr. Sabatino, for being with me here tonight. Hi, Jean. I'm happy to be here. Well, tonight I'm excited because this is a hot topic, mm. but biome because we're learning so much more about what's going on in our stomach. And I think it's so much more important than we ever, ever knew or gave credence to. So first of all, let's talk about what is the gut biome or microbiome in the first place? Well, what people don't realize is, you know, we have about 10 trillion cells in the human body. We have a hundred trillion combination of bacteria, fungi, protozoa, and organisms that live within us. And I think a legitimate question for anybody to ask is why would we have organ microorganisms that outnumber our entire cellular population 10 to 1 and outnumber us 100 trillion to 1? And so we've come to find out that this remarkable population of bacteria is referred to as the human microbiota, which is all of the organisms that live commensally with the human body. But understand that these organisms can live in different pockets. So there's a skin microbiota, there's a gut microbiota, there's a vaginal microbiota. So normally we talk about the gut microbiota, which is all of the organisms, and all of the genetic material of those organisms is referred to as the gut microbiome. So normally there's a microbiota, and just like there's a human genome, but what's intriguing is we have about 25,000 genes in the human body. There are 200 times that number of genes in that bacterial environment that lives within us. 200 times that. So it's amazing because now we've discovered that that population of organisms plays a major role in a whole panorama of mind-body health. Wow. So is this human microbiome like an example of symbiosis? Yeah, people call it commensal, because, but understand that within that population of organisms, there are both good and bad and in-between organisms. So there are things that can promote some toxic effects if they're not controlled. There are some that are absolutely beneficial, and there are some in-between. And apparently what happens is, that in, in a way, if you look at it from an evolutionary standpoint, the suggestion is, is that because bacteria can adapt so quickly to environmental circumstances, and it takes us as an organism to evolve over much longer periods of time to adapt, by having that population of supportive organisms, we have a kind of a, an upside to how we can evolve more rapidly in the environment. So they give us almost an evolutionary advantage to have that. Wow. Oh, my gosh. Well, we're did I get this microbiome? I mean, I didn't order it on like Amazon or anything prime, you know. No, we didn't. But in a way you did through your parents. We find that the bi microbiome actually begins before birth, even in the birthing process. And then very soon after birth in the way that the infant is fed. So for example, we now know that babies that are born vaginally and are breastfed have a much healthier and more diverse microbiome than babies that are you know, the, the, the delivered in hospitals and are not, and are, are bottle fed. So we find, for example, that the uh, largest part of the immune system is something called secretory IgA, and it lives in the gut. And we find that babies that are breastfed have a much better population, they have a much more elaborate immune system, secretory IgA, and they have a decrease in certain cytokines which promote inflammation. So it's intriguing that when you bottle feed a baby or they are not born vaginally, they're born by C-section or whatever, they don't have that excursion down the mother's vaginal microbiome. They don't have that journey where they're sucking all of that in and then they don't have that from the mother's breast milk. And we find that babies that are not conditioned by breastfeeding and vaginal delivery will have more inflammatory cytokines. 
and they can show up even later. So there's a suggestion that the way you're conditioned at birth and early feeding may set you up for inflammatory change in your earlier and your adult years. It's kind of intriguing. Wow. Well, why does my microbiome matter so much? Well, it matters for a number of reasons, because when we look at the human gut, we find that, again, this, this system is designed for us to absorb the com complicated material from the environment that we call food and break it down into simple steps and absorb the building blocks. So with protein, we're absorbing amino acids, with fats, fatty acids, and so on. The lining of the gut, the bacteria in the gut, play a very intimate role in how that digestive process ensues and how safe the lining of that gut is. Classic example would be in the large bowel, in the colon. You have cells in the colon that are fastened together by what are called tight junctions. So the cells uh, in the colon, and as you know, the colon is a space, it's a lumen, because food's passing through it. That tight junction of cells has a layer of mucus across it that allows the cells themselves to be protected from the bacterial and acidic environment of the gut or some of the changes going on in the gut. It so happens that when we eat a diet that is plant-based, for example, many of the fibers that we're incapable of digesting are the food for that population of organisms. And they are able to ferment those fibers that are in all the beautiful things we eat, whether it's whole grains, fruits, veggies. And then those bacteria will start to produce something called short-chain fatty acids that literally produce the mucus lining that protects the lining of the gut. And it also creates a lower acidic environment in that environment of the bowel, which is more conducive to protection against the toxic effects of the byproducts of digestion and so on. So they provide this massive protective effect, provide that mucus layer that protects those cells of the colon and protects those cells that are fastened together by these tight junctions. And these bacteria from the fermentation of those uh, resistant starches that are undigestible will produce a series of vitamins like B vitamins. They'll produce certain amino acids. They'll even produce certain uh, neurotransmitter substances like tryptophan and so on. So it's kind of intriguing that they play a very important role, a healthy role in establishing the integrity of the lining of the bowel that allows normal absorption to occur. And remember, the large bowel is so tight and fastened because it's designed really only to absorb two things, water and very small electrolytes. The bigger absorption happens up in the small intestine. The large bowel, which is a very anaerobic environment, supports the anaerobic bacteria that are providing the healthy lining of that gut. Wow. Okay, so you've got aerobic bacteria and anaerobic bacteria. Uh, so yeah, but the bowel, if you think about it, the bowel, the, large, the bowel, especially the large bowel, is a very closed anaerobic environment. So okay. bacteria that are more anaerobic, like uh, lactobacillus and bifidobacterium, they thrive in that environment. And they are thriving by, by, and it's always, always intriguing to me, that the very diet that provides the greatest health for us, which is a plant-based approach, that reduces the risk of so many diseases and problems is also the exact diet that supports the health of that entire population of bacteria that lives within us. Kind it's of like a, it was planned that way. Kind of looks, sounds like it was a plan to me. I didn't do it, but I love it. So, well, what would happen if to a person that's, you know, consuming the sad, the standard American diet, how is that impacting their gut biome? Well, a couple, of, a couple of things go on, and that's a great question. We know, for example, if you're eating a lot of refined processed food, those foods are actually devoid of fiber, really. They're really very fiberless. So they become very absorbed higher up in the small intestine. So there's, there's never that nutriment that's made available for those bacteria in your colon. But guess what? They got to eat too. So what will happen is if they can't be nurtured by those fibers and foods that we need to eat, they can start to eat off of that mucus lining and start to damage it. And certainly what will happen is when you eat that refined diet, it changes what we call the diversity of those bacteria. So for example, they've looked at very primitive cultures on planet Earth that eat a more diverse kind of plant vegetation based diet compared to people eating refined in the West. And they find one of the first things that happens is a loss of biological diversity 
of those bacteria. So it becomes much more limited, much more shallow, much more you know, unvaried compared to people eating plant-based. And so that diversity seems to be the key to health. We don't know, there's a lot that we don't know about you know, the populations of all the organisms and how they're interacting, but one thing we do know is that when you have more diversity of those organisms, you have a much greater health outcome and a much greater protective environment. So the bottom line is those foods lay the groundwork for damage to that lining, but we have a lot of other gut disruptors. For example, alcohol is one, stress is one, Pesticides and herbicides are a major one, like glyphosate, things what of that nature. I was just going to ask, how does glyphosate interact on the gut biome? Well, this, is a great, I, this is a great thing, because if you think about it, you know, Monsanto is a company that just keep, keep, keeps making those gifts that just keep giving. They started out with that wonderful gift, dioxin, or Agent Orange, which has plagued the genetic pool of people from the Vietnam War from that time forward. And then in the 1970s, they created a product called Roundup. And Roundup is an herbicide that is fundamentally made with glyphosate because they were trying to attack weeds and get better production from plants that were growing. And what they discovered, though, that there was a specific weed called Palmer amaranth that was starting to work its way through the cottonseed, soy, and corn crop. And so what they did, and this is... Monsanto again, they decided that, well, not only are we going to make the herbicide, but I think we're going to just genetically modify those seeds so that they can be resistant to weed killers like glyphosate and also resistant to certain bacteria that are attacking these plants. Now, the men, unfortunately, the mentality was now that those plants were more glyphosate resistant, they felt that they could spray even more with glyphosate. So what happens is they started spraying fields even more intensely. And if you've ever seen a field spray with glyphosate, it looks like people working in a nuclear reactor. They're in hazmat suits when they spray these fields. Could it be like it's hazardous to us? Yeah, you think it's hazardous that they're wearing a hazmat suit? No. And so they're spraying these fields. And of course, they missed a very big biological point. All biological organisms adapt. So these weeds started to adapt to these herbicides, and guess then what? Well, now you had to make even more devastating herbicides in addition to spraying with glyphosate. So what happens is all of these genetically formed crops, especially soy, corn, canola, they are massively sprayed with glyphosate. And even now, as you know, even oats and some of these other things are showing up. And so the bottom line is these are what are called endocrine and gut disruptors. So they cause damage in the gut. And here's what happens. Think about this. If you've got a bacterial population that's on the surface of your gut in the large bowel producing this beautiful mucus layer to protect the gut from these short-chain fatty acids like butyrate, which is one of the most dominant ones, when you damage these bacteria, ones that are more toxic can start to overgrow because you're disrupting the commensal environment. And what will start to happen is you'll start to have damage of that gut lining, that mucus lining, and a disruption of that fast and tight junction. And now that bowel, which was designed to absorb only very small molecules, now becomes leaky. And when it becomes leaky, we have that phenomenon called leaky gut, which now we start to absorb larger molecules through a lining that was not designed for it. And these larger protein molecules and endotoxins of more dam damaging bacteria start to get into the bloodstream. And what's the body going to do? It's going to trigger an inflammatory and immune response against those. And if those, if those proteins are similar to the ones in your thyroid or your joints, now you've got autoimmune thyroid and joint disease. So you've got Hashimoto's, you've got rheumatoid arthritis, but it all stems from the fact that these gut disruptors, alcohol is one, refined foods are one, herbicides and pesticides are another, all of those, they are disrupting that gut environment, which now leads to leaky changes in the gut, more inflammatory stuff, and the absorption of toxic debris that normally would not be there. And what's beautiful is those fatty acids produced by bacteria are protecting those gut cells from cancer growth. And so now when you disrupt that lining, they're going to be more at risk 
And especially if you're eating more animal products where you're getting a putrefaction of protein rather than digestion, you're freeing up a lot of toxic debris that can now be absorbed through that gut lining. So it's very devastating. And that's why I tell people you've got to really steer clear of GMO foods, especially corn, soy, canola, and you've got to get away from pesticides pesticides and herbicides as much as you can. But well, the gut, now they're spraying wheat just before they dry. I know, they're doing wheat to dry, right, and oats. And now they weren't even spraying those foods before, but now they're expanding. Yeah. I'm telling you, Monsanto's the gift that just keeps giving. Oh, my God. Well, I just did an interview with Jeffrey Smith, who was the director of Secret Ingredients. Have you heard about this movie? You told me about it. Yes, we talked a little bit about it. Oh, my gosh. I mean, it's absolutely crazy he followed several people through their stories, you know, and just the changes just by going organic and GMO that they were able to eliminate it. It's very important. Now, another major, a major disruptor, as you can imagine, is antibiotic abuse. I mean, that's a whole other thing. Uh, and what's intriguing is with the antibiotic, you're really skewing the bacterial population of the gut toward what are called more saprophytes, more dangerous organisms that are releasing endotoxins that they produce. So, you know, the antibiotic use is abusive, especially when you realize that in the United States, by the time a child hits about 18, they've been through 10 to 20 rounds of antibiotics in America. And if you start to think about the impact of that on the gut, and many of those kids were bottle fed, so they already had some tendency to inflammation. They've been vaccinated. They've had all of those issues that may have been compromised. And all of that is very, very real. And you're getting that suppression and aggravation of that whole immune response. And there's no mystery why we see more allergy, asthma, inflammatory-based disease. A lot of it is coming from the gut. And understand that when those toxins get into the bloodstream through the leaky gut lining, they're going everywhere, including the brain. And that's why there has been even some correlation between leaky gut and gut disruption of bacteria or the gut microbiome and mood changes, anxiety, depression. All, there are many psychiatrists and psychologists now who are treating mood changes and, and psychotropic problems, psycho, you know, psychological problems by adjusting gut flora with healthy diets and sometimes even some probiotics here or there if they do it. Well, so. that's one of the things. I mean, when you take an antibiotic, you should be following up with a probiotic. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the few times. Because if it's really a healthy person, if you think about it, the bigger issue is you've got 100 trillion bacteria. You're not going to have to worry about putting a lot of probiotic in. What's more important is that they're fed. So you want prebiotic. And prebiotic are all those fibers in the fruits, vegetables, and resistant starches of oats, potatoes, garlic, onions, all the things we recommend eating or what's so give, feeding that bacteria. Give us a, a, what's the difference between a prebiotic and a probiotic? Just think about prebiotic as basically the diverse fibers that are being provided by the fruits and vegetables. We can make it simple. But if you're looking at things like whole grains, legumes, cooked starches like potato, even cooked and cooled starches. For example, if I make a potatoes, like maybe you're making little Yukon gold potatoes, you make extra, put them in the fridge. And when you eat them cold the next day in a salad or you make a potato salad, that resistant starch will be the best foundation for the probiotic support of your gut. So those... Okay. Foods, if you heat those potatoes up after you've cooled them, does the resistant starch change the, its molecular structure back? Not really, no, because what happens is you're just cooling that starch. Well, what we do know is that an unbelievably feeds the gut it feeds gut bacteria in a healthy way so the bottom line is all the starches that we all the fibers that we can't digest that move through the gut we now know are uh, the fodder they're the groundwork for all of the fermentation that those bacteria need for their own support so this is another reason why high fiber low calorie dense diets that we recommend are so profound because they are the best food for that incredible gut lining. And we now know that that gut lining has an impact on everything from heart disease to inflammation to cancer to mood changes and so on. Well, what's the most common bacteria in the human gut? Well, we, you know, in the, you got things like what's called Prevotella, you've got uh, Bifidobacterium, we talked about it, you've got Lactobacillus of various kinds, and those are the ones you see in a lot of probiotic supplements. The problem is a lot of those probiotic supplements are not regulated well. And when they've evaluated some of them, they don't even have the organisms that they say that they have. 
So you almost need a USP grade form of probiotic or a therapeutic grade. But again, I try to caution people and say, look, for the most part, you don't need to be thinking about probiotic. You just need to feed what's there with the prebiotic fibers and foods that are in this eating plan, all the whole grains, legumes, you know, bananas, fruits, things of that nature, and give that bacterial population that food that it needs to survive. And by eating high fiber plant-based, that's exactly what you're doing. So I make my own yogurt and I use acidopolis. Okay. The soy milk. Is that not helping? Yeah, you can, you're talking now about fermented food. So when we talk right. about foods that are fermented, and they're done just the way you would ferment anything. They're put, they're food put with a bacterial population that then is cultured. And so we know that like cultured soy protein, like tempeh can be used in our diet and people use it or miso or sauerkraut is a classic example, or even apple cider vinegar to some degree will do that. So what I tell people is that instead of taking probiotic supplements, if you want to use a little bit of fermented food, on low salt and only organic soy fermented foods because again the organic ones don't have the spray we want to watch that gmo that gmo thing with soy it's because soy is the most genetically modified crop pretty much that exists what we do know is interestingly enough in some studies that were done on the elderly fermented foods decrease cognitive breakdown in the hippocampus in the brain so there was some benefit of having these foods in the system reducing or increasing nerve growth factor, increasing the integrity of nerves. And the hippocampus is the a part of the brain that's involved with memory and it's involved a lot with cognitive de de deficits. So there's an enzyme, there's a transmitter in that part of the brain that acts for memory, which is called acetylcholine. And there's an enzyme called acetylcholine esterase that breaks it down. So one of the models in Alzheimer's is that the breakdown enzyme is overrunning the system and you're getting more damage to nerve, tran nerve transmission. Apparently with some of these um, fermented foods, and again, sauerkraut, things like that, we see that that damaging enzyme becomes blocked a little bit. It's not breaking the uh, transmitter down as much. There's an increase in antioxidants in the brain areas of memory, so they actually showed some reversal of cognitive deficit in some studies, utilizing fermented food. So I think utilizing a little bit of tempeh or miso or just get it in a low sodium version. And to me, that would be a better way, having a good quality sauerkraut for a few ounces a few times a week, better than probably any probiotic supplement. And then just load up on all the prebiotic fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, all the stuff we always recommend. Right. Well, is it in the human gut biome, is it, is it generally better when there's more microbe diversity or less diversity? No, more diversity seems to be the better option. It appears that all healthier guts, healthier populations have more diversity because what happens is when you do more refined food, you wind up killing off diversity. You wind up, those organisms don't survive. And so the ones that survive sometimes become more of the more toxic, challenging, opportunistic bacteria that can harm us. But when you eat the diversity of plants, you get the diversity of population of bacteria. And that seems to be incredibly important for a lot of stability. You know, we know that there are nine species of bacteria in the gut, at least nine, that will convert, for example, the choline and L-carnitine in red meat into something called trimethylamine oxide, TMAO. And TMAO has been linked with all-cause mortality from cardiovascular events strokes, heart disease. We also know that when that goes up, it also stimulates atherosclerotic placking. So, you know, you're getting possible DVTs and plaque formation and that kind of thing. And so, you know, it's interesting that those foods are translated into damaging compounds in addition to the food itself providing the damaging compounds for us. And what's intriguing is that TMAO from red meat is produced by gut bacteria. But TMAO exists as TMAO without, without conversion in the body of fish. So people that think eating fish is the, really the way to go, you don't even have to convert to TMAO in fish. It's a direct, it's a direct input into the body. And not only that, in, in, in studies that have been done, in eating fish in 15 minutes, you'll find it in the serum, in the bloodstream, TMAO. So it shows up very quickly. Apparently fish have it as a natural product to protect them against some urea cycle that is very more common in fish. 
So, you know, people that think fish is the way to go, I think you're going to need to rethink that, especially in relationship to heart disease risk. And well, with plant. also the toxins that are in fish now, it's... Well, that's it's, a whole other, all the mercury and everything else that goes uh, on with it, you know. So, but, but I thought that was a kind of an interesting observation that TMAO, which people talk about from eating meat and especially red meat, it's showing up in fish too. And it's showing up in foods that have high choline and L-carnitine, which is a lot of red meat, but also the fish. you got to think about it. Wow. I hadn't heard that. Wow. Oh, my gosh. Well, uh, changing topics. Triclosan is, is an antibacterial agent. It's used okay. in a lot of products. How is triclosan going to affect the human gut biome? Well, they've looked at it a little bit. I mean, triclosan is a really antibacterial and an antifungal. And unfortunately, as you know, it shows up in toothpaste. It shows up in soaps and body lotions. Yeah. So now it supposedly has been banned from soaps, but that banning has not been a good banning because the FDA can't really stay on top of it. So we're still seeing it, for example, in Dial liquid soap, a lot of it. We're seeing it in CBS liquid soap. So a lot of these liquid soaps and some of the toothpaste, where it doesn't show up are in some of these like Tom's and some of these toothpaste, apparently they don't have it. So they may have other issues you may want to address, but they don't have that. And what we're finding is that if mamas are using that, it'll show up in breast milk in babies. For example, babies that are exposed to antibacterials a lot will have a compromise, again, of their own immune system and bacteria that's supporting their immune development. And so we're going to see a lot of allergy, asthma, and so on in infants and children by the exposure to these compounds. And they, again, are gut disruptors. It has the same effect like you would with an antibiotic in a way. You're, now, the argument is that in some of these body products, it's in a low enough dose. But again, it can accumulate and, and blah, blah, blah. It's bioaccumulative. Right. It's bioaccumulative. And so to answer your question, yeah, it has a big impact on the function of the immune system in children and in adults. And it's a toxic product that may even have, we're finding that it may act as an agonist at estrogen receptors. So it may trigger estrogen-induced light growth and tumor change uh, in a, while it's not estrogen. So there's kind of an agonistic effect at estrogen receptors. So if you have an estrogen-induced tumor of some kind, this may actually augment that. So there's studies going on to look at that a little bit. Oh, my. Oh, my. So my advice well, is to avoid it. <laughs> well, I just think back. I was an elementary principal. And one of the things that the teachers would do in the beginning of the years was send out this list, please buy all these things and send it into the classroom. And one of the biggest things that they wanted was hand sanitizers because, I mean, like little kids, you know, first grade, second grade, they're coughing, sneezing, hacking all over the place. And I get why they wanted to do that, and especially to try and get kids into the elementary, you know, the lunchroom, you know, right. six-year-olds to like right. send them to wash their hands. That could be an hour, you know, like, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but you know what? There's a certain aspect of that that if you think about it, if you watch infants and children, they're eating off the floor. They're eat There's a certain aspect of that exposure that becomes important. I used to love this routine by George Carlin because he would talk about how resistant he was to disease because as a child he swam in the Hudson River. And he said, after you swim in the Hudson River or the East River, there's nothing that can kill you. And in a way, it's true. Who knew, who knew from peanut allergies years ago? Now you go on a plane, you can't open a bag of peanuts. They're, they're coming over the loudspeaker. If you have peanuts, don't open a bag. And, you know, some of that is part of the fact that some of those fractured peanut oils have been used as adjuvants in the vaccine program, by the way. So you're conditioning some of that sensitivity in the vaccination programs in infants. And so the... There was a pediatrician, I think it was Larry Pavlevsky in New York, that talked about peanut oils in the uh, vaccine programs and some of the routine vaccines that are given to infants and children. So, you know, look, the bottom line is we want to make the immune system stronger. It's made stronger by the exposures to some degree of organisms in the environment. That's been the history of man. This idea that we want to put everybody in a bubble now and you've got to hand sanitize everything and you've you got to, you know, I, I, oh. just, I just don't do all of that. We used to line the kids up. Well, they still do. I mean, but when I was elementary principal, they would line them up and each kid, they would go down the line and they would do this several times a day. Right. You know, on the way to the... To, so if you think about outside. all of that antibacterial exposure and the impact that that may have on their own microbiota relationship, you can begin to see how bizarre and crazy it actually gets. And, and then these kids are having such a compromised immune response. They're taken down by everything. 
And the fact of the matter is they need to get stronger, not weaker. Well, how do I know if my gut biome is healthy? Well, I mean, you'll know by virtual general aspects of health. You don't have a lot of bacteria. You don't have discomfort in digestion. You may not have a lot of bloating. You may have, you know, some more normal bowel function. Energy will be good. Many times when the bowel is really not functioning well and the bacteria are not digesting well, you'll get, you know, fatigue. You'll get cramping. You'll get ups and downs with energy. You may even have mood shifts and things that you don't quite understand. So there can be things of that nature. But the best way is to just really take a look at how you're eating on a routine basis and how much stress. Remember, cortisol from stress, chronic stress, is a bacterial disruptor in the gut. So cortisol can create that dysbiotic state. Remember I talked about the bacteria being disturbed. That state is actually called dysbiosis, where the lining of the gut starts to break down because bacteria are being shifted and damaged. Probiotic, dysbiotic. So dysbiosis is a foundation for a lot of inflammatory change. So you may start feeling, my feeling is if you have autoimmune disease or you have joint pain and you have all, there may be a gut relationship to that. Or if you're finding yourself depressed and anxious for no apparent, there may be a gut relationship to that. Now you can do gut evaluation and permeability studies through stool. You can do that. And you have companies like Diagnostex and Great Smokies in North Carolina that if you submit a stool sample, they'll give you a short-chain fatty acid profile and they'll give you an idea of the actual, the actual population of your gut flora. So that can be done through people's physicians and functional medicine people. So if you really wanted to know, you could actually test some of that. Was well, that the only way? I mean, just by stool samples? Other than symptom or? picture and the way I described it, yeah, kind of. You know, but you can do stool samples and you can do just general evaluation. I can tell by looking at the diet if it's going to be a compromise. I mean, if you're not eating the foods we're recommending and your diet is very refined and processed and you're loaded with dairy and animal products and not enough fiber in plants, you can pretty much count on it. You can count on the fact that you're going to have a gut disruption at some time. Wow. Wow. Oh, my God. Well, and don't underestimate the impact of this on things like mental health, and that's a, a very big area right now. Oh, um, you know, we have, we, you know, not only do we have all that bacteria, but we have another nervous system in the body. It's about 100 million nerves that control everything from swallowing to defecation called the enteric nervous system. It's embedded in the wall of your entire digestive system. And that communicates with the CNS, the central nervous system. So that's called the, usually the little brain, ENS enteric nervous system, but that gut brain connection happens even on a neurological level. And you have cells that are woven into your normal bowel cells and normal bowel epithelium that are called enteric chromaffin and endocrine cells. So there's cells that are kind of woven into the normal cells of the gut and they release a series of chemicals based on stimulation by some of the bacterial release that can get into the blood and affect brain function, it can affect circulation. So for example, we know that about 95% of the serotonin, which is a neurotransmitter that most people are concerned about in depression, 95% of it is in the gut. Only 5% is in the brain. Wow. Now, there's a blood-brain barrier, which is a tight junction of blood vessels that protects your, CS, your cerebral spinal fluid and brain from what's circulating in your blood. But apparently when you have dysbiosis, some of those inflammatory chemicals can damage that blood-brain barrier. And, and then, so stuff is getting through now. And then stuff can actually get through that normally would be protected and blocked. So the bottom line is normally the serotonin in the gut is not making its way into the brain. But serotonin plays a role in, in gut motility, movement of the gut, a lot of gut function. So we see transmitter effects that happen in the gut that, and that, you know, uh, the, the words that we use in English, think about it. You have a gut feeling about something. It's kind of intriguing. We have language in our language, words in our language that talk about, kind of talk to that gut-brain connection. But there's a very profound gut-brain And then very neuroprotective chemicals that are released by healthy bacteria can make their way and support brain function. So we're seeing now that anxiety, depression, things of that nature – can be affected by a, a dysregulation of the gut, by a dysbiosis of the gut. Well, it, how does it function or play a major role in diseases like obesity, type 2 diabetes, cancer, autoimmune diseases? Well, you're asking a very deep question. The autoimmune we talked about, because when you get that dysbiosis and you open that gut, 
that right. tight junction, now more macro, larger molecules can seep through. And the, go, the large bowel, the colon, is not designed to have that happen. You want only small things absorbed. So now when you have, let's suppose you want an amino acid to be absorbed from, a, from the digestion of a protein. And now you have a bigger chain of like a, a small polypeptide, a bunch of amino acids, not quite as big as the protein, but a little bit of a fragment that's bigger than just an isolated amino acid. If that seeps through that lining, your body sees that as a foreign protein. And it will now create an immune response against it. And if that protein that you ate in, the, let's say, the meat you ate is similar to the protein in your joints, if your body attacks that protein, what do you think it's going to do when it finds the same protein in your joint? It's going to attack that protein. Oh. And now that's what autoimmune disease is. Your own immune system is yeah. programmed now to attack you. And if it finds a protein in your thyroid similar to that protein, let's say in gluten, like the gliadin in gluten, it's going to attack the thyroid. And now you've got Hashimoto. So the body will be set up by this eating plan. So the way we incorporate these really incredible plant-based foods can break all that down, gets rid of all of it. That's why when we talk about dealing with autoimmune inflammatory disease, there is nothing like this eating plan to help that. Now, when we talk about obesity, interestingly enough, there are 20 or so plus chemicals released from even the distal part of the small bowel that are linked with satiety signals in the brain. So the bacteria are either even playing a role on giving feedback that determine how we achieve the sense of fullness and satiety. They're working with us even in that regard. So oh, for yeah. example, that, I find that really quite remarkable. I find that the short chain fatty acids stimulate parts of the bowel to create those, those satiety signals distally. And if you think about it, Think about what's one of the byproducts of treating animals in the animal food production industry with antibiotics. What happens to them? What happens to them when they eat, when get antibiotics? They fatten them up. So antibiotics have an impact on fattening farm animals. What do you think is going to happen when you've got children by the age of 18 that have 10 to 20 rounds of antibiotics? You think it may be contributing to the childhood obesity epidemic that we have? Maybe. Got to think about that. But so it plays a role in signaling for hunger, signaling for all of that. As far as diabetic change, yeah, there are some data to suggest that this whole model plays a role on sugar stability, insulin resistance. There's early preliminary data, but there's a lot that we don't know. And there's a lot of research that is going on to try to understand where this whole process takes place and how this bacteria population is affecting these other kinds of physiological systems like blood sugar regulation but i'm going to guarantee you that it's playing some role we don't have we don't have a hundred trillion bacteria in that body that outnumber us so much that's not playing a role probably in just about every function that we have and there are data that are accumulating to show that the data on the microbiome alone on cancer is profound because we find that these short chain fatty acids and also, many of the products that we know as healthy in fruits and vegetables, like, for example, the isoflavones in soy, or the curcuminoids in turmeric, or the catechins in green tea, or the tannins in berries and nuts, and so on, these things are, in some cases, also produced by the biome. And even when they're not, the biome is producing chemicals that allow the, the conversion of those products in the actual fruits and vegetables that we're eating. And we're now finding, for example, that those catechins and those tannins that are produced by that bacteria are going to actually foster either methylation or acetylation of the actual gene pool of genes within, within the gut cells to prevent cancer. They literally will change the genetic environment of our own cells to suppress cancer growth, to suppress promoter genes that are signaling cancer growth. So we now know that that bacterial population is the gene pool of that bacterial population is playing a major role to work with the plants that we're eating to modify the phytonutrients that they provide or to produce one similar to the plants themselves that provide and help us prevent the outcome of cancer. And we know that we see that in the bowel, but because those chemicals get into the blood, it may prevent cancers across many different systems and many different organs, but that's where the research has to elaborate things a lot further. We don't have the evidence base for all of that, but we do have the evidence base for some of what I just said in terms of these 
polyphenols and isothiocyanates, all these phytochemicals that we know are so protective in broccoli and cruciferous veggies and berries and all of that, they're being produced to some degree by the bacteria in our gut themselves when we eat those very foods. How do you like that? So eating the foods that are giving us all those antioxidants and phytonutrients are also supporting our own bacteria to produce those and convert those more successfully in the food that we're eating. I find it remarkable. I oh mean, my it, gosh. It just blows my mind. The whole process blows my mind. Yeah. I mean, and what we're learning about this, it's just absolutely, yeah, it does. It's mind blowing. Well, can we alter our gut microbiome by altering our diet? Yeah, it changes all the time. That's the intriguing thing. Normally it's set in place by about the age of three, pretty much. And then based on how you're eating in your family, it's going to establish a certain tone. But let's suppose you've been eating very refined and now you start eating all of these healthy foods. Yeah, you're going to start increasing the diversity and the development of those because now you're going to start feeding the things. You're going to have things come alive that were just dormant and damaged. And so, you know, part of healing, and this may be a very important piece to talk about, part of overall healing probably is healing the gut microbiome if you really think about it. So it's not only healing the liver or healing the heart or healing your insulin resistance or healing, or healing that tumor. Probably the overall process of healing takes place when you're healing the body in addition to the microbiome that works in conjunction with it to support these functions. And I think we're going to see that elaborated more and more as research right. comes in and we look at things closer over time. Well, what happens to our gut flora microbiome when we're on a plant-based versus an animal-based diet? Well, like I just said, it, it flourishes because, we, see, if you don't provide the fibers that those foods need for their nutrition, those bacteria need right. to ferment for their own integrity, they don't, they're not being nurtured. It would be like you and I having a garden and not putting the nutrients into the garden. What's going to happen? Everything's going to die. So those bacteria start to die off and you get a shift. If you had, let's suppose you had some relationship between all these bacteria, well, by how you're eating, you're skewing that community, that arrangement in one direction or another. And we now know that the more processed and animal-based the diet is, you start seeing more dominant species that are not in our best interest and losing the ones that are. So the diversity shifts. You see challenges to bifidobacterium, lactobacillus, things that are very positive for us can start to be damaged and lost and other bacteria that may be, you know, enterococcal bacteria or E. coli and things that may actually provide some endotoxins that are challenging, they start to overgrow in that process. And so we're seeing that kind of shift in the environment. So if you think about it as a big garden, you want to feed those organisms the food that that garden requires. And I'm here to tell you that it's just an exclusive plant-based approach. That's what it wants. That's what it needs. And when you cut out the fiber and you give it those high fats and you give it those high animal proteins, you start shifting literally the acidic environment of the large bowel. The, lar the small chain fatty acids like butyrate will create a more acidic environment that supports the healthier anaerobic bacteria in that large bowel. When you lose the ability to produce those short chain fatty acids because you're damaging those bacteria by not giving them the fiber that they need, that, that bowel becomes less acidic and more prone to supporting other organisms that are not in our best interest. And then those toxins can be absorbed and we will have problems. Wow. It contributes how, how long does this process take? Let's say somebody has been on the SAD diet for 50 years. If you've had a lot of damage over time, it could take months and it could even take maybe longer. But the bottom line is changes will begin to occur very quickly if you start feeding that body what it needs. Think about how quickly we see people recover from disease when we start feeding them well. Many times you see changes happen very quickly. We'll see blood pressure drop and, you know, the blood sugar improve in the space of a couple of weeks on people. Cholesterol levels change in the space of weeks to months. So we see things change relatively quickly. And I think the bacterial population, when you feed it, the prebiotics, and so, because think about this, think about the redundancy that's probably built in by having 100 trillion bacteria in the body. So even if a whole slew of them were damaged, if you start feeding them what they need, I think you're going to have that bacterial population come back really well pretty quickly well i just in my mind i was thinking about this i know you do a lot of fasting and helping people you know go through this process that 
that want to like detox their body. Right. How does that impact the gut biome? That's a fantastic question. In fact, there's only some data on more short-term effects that seem to radically improve that. There are some studies that have come out that suggest that longer fast may not. It may be a, a bit of a compromise, so we have to generate data on that. We have to look more carefully at what happens between the shorter periods of food deprivation and the longer periods and what the impact on the gut flora is. Those studies have not been done. And they really are radical studies that should be done. Yeah. And looking at pre and post longer, shorter fast in the same people, evaluating those bacterial populations, what's there, what isn't, what changed. It hasn't been done that way. And hopefully in these fasting centers and places that we have, uh, maybe we can get to those questions. It would be awesome. I would, would love, I would love those answers to those questions. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, because we know that fasting can help in so many different ways, but I'm just wondering what we the We know that fasting is. dramatically heals damaged bowels. We know that. What the impact is on the actual bacterial population over long periods of time, we need to look at that a lot closer. We don't have the... When impact. you say long period, how many, what are we talking? talking more than like, uh, more than uh, two, three weeks of fasting. I'm talking about longer periods of fasting, even longer than a week. You know, right now, there are some data to suggest what happens in short periods, four or five days and looking at that. But, if, you know, we sometimes have people on two and three week fasts and maybe even longer sometimes. So what's the real impact on the flora for that? I think it's a positive impact in the big picture, but we don't know that, all those answers. Well, Dr. Sabatino, it's always a pleasure to connect with you because you are like a walking encyclopedia. Well, I mean, fun. We always have fun. You know that. I know, I know. We have fun, we inform people, I have a blast, it's always fun, so. But it's important for people to know that really the bottom line to this is not complicated. You need to eat a diverse, really whole food, plant-based approach. Oh, That's really the solution. From the rainbow? That, that, is, that is, you know, if you had any other reasons to do that, this is a major reason to do that, bottom yeah. line. Like eat from the rainbow. That's yeah. right, That's right. without question. And the more that you can get from the different plants, from the rainbow, the different colors, the phytonutrients, I mean, it's amazing. Yes. And just to see it. But I think the gut biome is going to be a huge, huge player coming up, you know, on no terms question. of research. No, it's already becoming bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. But yes, I, I think there's going to be a lot of answers that come from health and disease patterns from how we engage and nurture that garden within. So did we, did we miss any big points? I don't think so. We covered a lot. I mean, there's always so much more to talk about, but I think we covered the issues related to, you know, we talked about inflammation, a little bit about heart disease, cancer, m mental health. Yeah, I think we covered a lot of things. I think it was a good beginning, a good panorama. In the next article, next issue of uh, Health Science, those of that are not members of the NHA, I have a small article just on this topic that's coming out in the next issue. So those are those well, people you've that been... join that organization. I recommend it. Well, the National Health Association, healthscience.org, got to send a shout out to that. Right. You've send been with out. them for a long time. And we're at balanceforlifeflorida.com, and you can always come and visit us there, too. So, Right. How long have you been with the NHA? Oh, my God. I go back. I'm one of the, uh, one of the old guys. The old, moldy know, the oldies? The NHA's been around 70 years. I've been associated with them just about 40. So that's a long time. You clearly got the memo long before I, most I of us. I got the memo a long time ago. I did. I did. You did. I, was, I like to tell people like the country song. I was doing this when it wasn't cool. You know what I'm saying? Yes, you were. Now it's cool. But I'm glad it's cool. I'm glad there's people. You know what? I just love the fact that people are jumping on the bandwagon. It's time. It it's is. Time. It's time to change the world, and it's time to change the pattern of health on this planet. Absolutely. Well, look at you. I mean, seriously. You don't look your age. I'm sorry. You don't. You look amazing. You're in incredible health. I mean, you can go out and... Uh, I tell people I haven't had a drop of medication in over 55 years. That's a lot of time. It's true. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> I mean, and just think about it. You raised your kids this way. And, that kids way. and again, this is a group of children. Now, they have got older and they went on their own. But to the time that they were in the household, up to their you know, early 20s, this is five children that never had an antibiotic. When you think about the fact that in the culture, by the time most kids are 18, about 10 to 20 rounds. So that's pretty different, pretty different. Yeah. And, I, and, the real, and the real answer for that was just living on a plant-based approach. That, that's really the bottom line. Bottom that, line. It's all about the food, and it makes so much difference. 
It's the food. Yes. Change your food, change your health destiny. You got it, baby. That's it. All right. Well, okay. we'll be back because, oh my God, this is just scratching the surface of the gut biome. So thank you so much, Dr. Sabatino. You my always pleasure. are amazing. My pleasure. my pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me. I, I appreciate it.